Good morning. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at Asbury United Methodist Church. It's a joy to have you with us on this Sunday morning. I imagine we have lots of folks worshiping online right now because it is chilly outside and uh, perhaps they chose to stay at home. And that's okay. We're glad if you're worshiping from home. We're glad if you're worshiping here in the sanctuary. Uh, it is a beautiful day that God has given to us. It is an unusually chilly day uh, for us Floridians, but we'll take the cold weather as we get it. Amen? Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Let's pray together. God, as we gather on this Martin Luther King weekend, uh, we do give you thanks uh, for the life, the witness, the legacy of Dr. King and for all that he did to make America, our country, a better place and remind us, God, that we are all your children. Regardless of the color of our skin, we have been made in your image. We are people of worth and value and everybody deserves equal rights. Uh, how grateful we are for this church family, this congregation, Asbury United Methodist Church that you have breathed into being. Uh, we're grateful to start this new sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. And so, God, please use me as a preacher. Uh, if necessary, speak in spite of me. May all of us today hear a word from you that would change our lives and help us to live as your people in this world. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said amen. 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 Well, a photographer who was a confirmed atheist, somebody who does not believe in God, went into the woods to get pictures of the fall foliage. It was an absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, breathtaking day. Mid-October, leaves were falling, birds were chirping. There was a nice, gentle breeze and a brook babbling in the background. Well, then suddenly as he was taking pictures, this photographer found himself confronted by this massive, giant, 600-pound grizzly bear. Initially, the bear was at a distance, but then when the bear looked and saw the man, the bear started running toward him. The man was totally terrified, and understandably so. He ran away as fast as he possibly could, but the bear was faster than he was. The bear was catching up, closing in on him, and then what happened next is the photographer tripped over a tree branch. He fell on his chest, and then when he rolled over on his back, who was standing above him? The bear just about to rip him to shreds. And that's when this photographer, who again was an atheist, doesn't believe in God, he called out, Dear God, save me! Dear God, rescue me! Suddenly everything stopped. The leaves stopped falling. The birds stopped chirping. The wind stopped blowing. The brook stopped babbling. And the photographer heard a voice from heaven. Young man, all these years you doubted my existence. And now you're praying to me. Why the change of heart? And the photographer said, you're right, God. It's hypocritical for me to pray right now, given the fact that I've been an atheist for so many years. But do me a favor. Can you at least make the bear a creature of prayer? And the voice said, done. And everything went back to normal. Leaves were falling, birds were chirping, the wind was blowing, the brook was babbling. And then the bear put his paws together, and he said, dear Lord, please bless this food to the nourishment of my body. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> As human beings, there is something intrinsic, isn't there, that leads us to pray? Even if we don't consider ourselves all that religious, even if we're indifferent to God, even if we're agnostic or an atheist like that photographer, in moments of intense desperation, we pray, we cry out, we grab on to the very one who made us, created us, designed us, and holds all things together. Uh, I'm not sure who said this, but I came across this quote this week. I thought it was really good. Somebody once said that to be human is to pray. To be human is to pray. That prayer is an integral part of our humanity. Prayer is the defining feature of what it means to be a person. Uh, it comes as no surprise then that according to a study I read online this week, uh, this study was taken back in 2017, six years ago. According to the study, prayer is the most common faith practice or spiritual practice among adults. No matter where we find ourselves on the religious spectrum, whether we're a church-going person or not a church-going person, virtually all of us, if not all of us, we engage in prayer. But even though prayer is commonly practiced, my sense is that for a lot of us, prayer comes as 
comes off as confusing, baffling, it's mysterious. Questions come to mind about prayer, such as, how do we pray? What do we say? What are the mechanics of prayer that we should be aware of? Well, the encouraging news, the good news with all of this is that Jesus gave us both a template for prayer and a prayer itself when he taught us the most famous prayer of all and the Gospels. And that would be what? The Lord's Prayer, what our Catholic friends call the Our Father. Now, the Lord's Prayer is not found in all the Gospels. For example, it's not found in the Gospel of Mark. It's not found in the Gospel of John. It is only found in two of the Gospels, and that would be the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. For our purposes, I'm going to focus on the way that the Lord's Prayer is presented in the Gospel of Matthew. Again, it's also in Luke, but I want to focus on the way that it's presented in the Gospel of Matthew. So this is from Matthew 6, verses 9 through 13. And to set the backdrop, Jesus is presenting this prayer as part of his Sermon on the Mount. In the Gospel of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew 5, goes all the way to chapter 7. And so Jesus offers this prayer right inside that teaching. Jesus says this, Pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God, to which we all say in response, thanks be to God. Now keep in mind, what I just read is a modern translation of Matthew chapter 6. When we typically recite the Lord's Prayer, we don't recite it from a modern translation of the Bible. Instead, we recite it from what translation? Do you remember? The King James Version. Uh, The King James Version of the Bible was put together more than 400 years ago in 1611. And so it has the Old English words like hallowed and thy and thine. But regardless of the translation, the reason we call this prayer the Lord's Prayer is that this prayer was given to us by none other than the Lord Jesus himself. And in fact, this prayer became so famous and well-known in the early church that by the end of the first century A.D., just 50 or 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the early Christians were praying this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, at least three times a day. Three times a day. In the morning when they woke up, in the afternoon, and then at nighttime just before bed. It was the custom of Jews during this time period, 2,000 years ago, to pray three times a day. And then as Christianity grew out of Judaism, Christians began incorporating this particular prayer into their lives, and they prayed it three times a day. And if you're like me, you were taught the Lord's Prayer growing up as a child. How many of you were taught the Lord's Prayer as a kid growing up? Virtually all of us. Uh, I remember my mom. um, She would come into my bedroom just before bed, and she would tuck me in, and we would have a general word of prayer, and then we would close that time together. My mom and I would. Uh, Also my brother, because he and I shared a room. Uh, We would close that time together by saying the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is also something that Amanda and I, as parents, we have had the joy of teaching our own children. In fact, uh, there's a video I want to share with you. This video was taken when our daughter Hannah was two years old. As she was ready to say the Lord's Prayer? Here we go. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Again, that video was taken when Hannah was just two years old as she was praying the Lord's Prayer. Uh, she and her brother are going to be five years old next week, and so uh, we're really proud of how they're growing and how God is uh, continuing to have his hand upon their lives. But the Lord's Prayer is a prayer uh, that, like Hannah, a lot of us have committed to memory um, from an early age. But my sense is that sometimes the familiarity of the Lord's Prayer, the familiarity can be, can be a gift, but it can also be a challenge because it causes us to overlook the significance and the power 
behind the words that we're saying. I mean, folks, have we taken the time to really focus on the words that we're saying when we're praying the Lord's Prayer? This is a remarkable prayer. This is an incredible prayer given to us by the Lord Jesus. And so starting this morning here at Asbury, uh, we are kicking off a new sermon series, our first sermon series for the new year, 2023. And the name of the series is Pray Like This. Can you say this with me? Pray like this. Uh, those words are taken from Matthew 6, verse 9, uh, in which Jesus says, pray like this. And what we're going to be doing in the sermon series over the next six weeks, how many weeks? Six weeks over the next month and a half, uh, we're going to be examining, breaking down each one of the lines, phrases, petitions that we find in the Lord's Prayer. And my hope, my prayer for our congregation here at Asbury is that by the time we finish the sermon series six weeks from now, we will walk away with a new appreciation for the Lord's Prayer. We will never pray the Lord's Prayer the same way again. We'll never look at the Lord's Prayer the same way again. And we'll allow this prayer given to us by the Lord Jesus to inspire, shape, define, invigorate, give life to our own prayer lives. Amen? And so what we're going to do in this message is we're going to look carefully at the very first line of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the words are up here on the screen. Let's say this together on the count of three. One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, if we notice, there are three parts to this first line. First, our Father. Second, who art in heaven. Third, hallowed be thy name. And so let's focus on the first part, our Father. And actually, before we go any further, let's narrow our attention to that opening word. O-U-R. R. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we don't say, my Father who art in heaven, but our Father who art in heaven. And that one word difference might seem pretty small. It's not. It's a pretty big deal. I mentioned a moment ago that Hannah and Noah, our twins, are going to be five years old. Uh, actually, next week, their birthday is on January 22nd. And so as I was working on the sermon, I was reminded of that video of Hannah praying the Lord's Prayer that we took almost three years ago. And um, I also was thinking back to when Hannah and Noah were first learning how to talk. And just how excited and um, full of joy Amanda and I were about that. We were so proud of them. And there were all kinds of words that we started to teach Hannah and Noah. We taught them words like mama, dada. We taught them words like Teddy and Nala, which are the names of our pups. We taught them Jesus. We taught them the Lord's Prayer. However, there was one word that we never specifically taught Hannah and Noah, but for some reason they quickly picked up on it, and they started using it, saying it virtually all the time. Anybody want to guess what it is? Uh, the word no was one of them as well. People at the last service said that too. So yes, it was no, but that's not the word I'm thinking of. It was another one. Mine. Exactly. Thank you, Olga. Mine. M-I-N-E, mine. Whenever they got a hold of something, that was their go-to word. Mine, 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 mine. So we had to recondition them. We're still having to recondition them. Not mine. Ours. What you have is for everybody. As human beings, we adopt this tendency pretty early in our lives, from the time we're able to speak, to think first of ourselves, mainly of ourselves. And folks, this tendency can show up in the way that we worship. It can show up in the way that we theologize and talk about God. For example, we sing worship songs like this. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Or how about this one? I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm a child of God. We say phrases like, Jesus is my personal Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. The focus tends to be on who? On the individual and thus the personal. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't mishear me. Don't misquote me. Our faith is personal. It is deeply personal but it's also communal. We don't pray in the Lord's Prayer, my Father who art in heaven, 
Instead, we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven. And that R signifies at least two things for us. Number one, God's love is not for one person. God's love is not for an individual. Rather, God's love is for the entire world. What does Jesus say in John 3, 16, the most famous Bible verse? Jesus says, for God so loved the For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus doesn't say, for God so loved one person, for God so loved an individual. He says, for God so loved the world. The Greek word that is used there for world in John 3, 16 is cosmos. In other words, it refers to the entire universe and every single person in it. God's love is for the whole world. That's the first thing that the R in the Lord's Prayer signifies to us. The second thing that it signifies to us is this. God desires that we express our faith together. Listen, there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. Christianity is not a solo affair. It's a team sport. To be a Christian is to be married into this messy group of people that Jesus has put together called the church. You know, it's interesting. In both Matthew and Luke, when Jesus gives the Lord's Prayer, he doesn't give it to people as individuals. It's not as if Jesus says, hey, Peter. Remember Peter, the disciple? He doesn't say, hey, Peter, I'm going to give you this prayer. Or, hey, John, I'm going to give you this prayer. Hey, James, I'm going to give you this prayer. No, he gives it to people collectively as a group. And today, when we pray this prayer all these years later, even when we're praying it by ourselves, by saying the word are, we're reminded that we join with Christians from all over the world, that they belong to God like you and I do, and we need them to live out and express and embody our journey of faith. We don't pray to my Father. We pray to our Father. And that brings us then to the second word, Father. Of all the ways to address God, Jesus invites us to address God as Father. You know, in the Old Testament, God is hardly ever referred to as Father. There are a few times in which God is called Father, but not many. Primarily, God is called God, Elohim in the Hebrew, or he's called Yahweh, uh, Lord. But Jesus encourages us to call God Father, which means that God wants us to know him in a way that's relational and intimate. God wants us to know him in a way that's relational and intimate. Now keep in mind, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. However, Jesus did not speak Greek. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Aramaic was the language of Jesus and the apostles. The Aramaic word that Jesus used for father here, does anybody know what it is? It starts with the letter A. Abba. Sometimes Abba is spelled A-B-B-A. Uh, I've also seen it spelled A-B-A, but Abba. Abba is an affectionate name that basically means dad or daddy. Even father is kind of formal. But dad? That signifies closeness. I've shared before a story from Pastor John Ortberg. He says that uh, at one point there was this three-year-old boy and this three-year-old boy, sometimes he would, uh, if he was feeling anxious or lonely or scared when he was at home, he would simply hold up his arms like this, and he would say to his father, hold you, daddy, hold you. That's the three-year-old version of hold me, daddy, hold me. So his father would stop what he was doing, and he would pick his son up, and it didn't seem to matter what was going on in that little boy's world. Maybe he had had a bad dream or something like that. Somehow just being in his dad's arms was enough to know, it's all, everything's going to be okay. Well, then that little boy grew up, and he got married. And then one day he found out that his spouse was going to leave him for somebody else. He was devastated, heartbroken, got in the car, drove five hours to see his dad. His dad met him at the front door, and he immediately collapsed in his father's arms and was sobbing. And his father could swear that he heard his grown son, who was in his mid-30s, say, Hold your daddy. Hold you. Jesus reveals a God who wants to hold us, be close to us. 
Now, it's important to recognize, uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't address this, it's important to recognize that sometimes we get caught up in that father language, and it confuses us a little bit. So let me say a word about this. Some people think when we call God Father, oh, that must mean that God is male. I want to be clear, that's not what it means. God is not male. God is not female, for that matter. God transcends categories like gender. God is spirit, as the Bible says in 1 John 4, 24. The reason we call God Father, it's not because God is male, because he's not. The reason we call God Father is this. Father is the revealed name of God. The Christian faith is rooted in revelation. Father is the revealed name of God. Father is the name given to us by Jesus himself. And listen, if we're somebody in worship today, either here in this room or worshiping online, and maybe we had a bad relationship with our earthly father, or we had no relationship with our earthly father, we remember, we keep in mind that God is the one who defines what true fatherhood and parenthood is. Nobody else does except for God. We pray to our Father, but he's not simply our Father. He's our Father who art in heaven. That's the very next part of this first line of the prayer. Now, first, this part feels strange, doesn't it? It feels strange and awkward to address God, to seemingly address God, in terms of geographical location. After all, we don't address our earthly parents in terms of their location, Uh, For example, I called my dad on Friday on the phone, uh, January 13th. It was his birthday, so I called to wish him a happy birthday. But when I called my dad, I didn't say, hey, dad, who lives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida? You don't say, hey, dad, who lives in Phoenix, Arizona? Hey, dad, who lives in Nashville, Tennessee? Hey, mom, who lives in Sacramento, California? So why do we address God as our father who art in heaven? Heaven isn't so much the place where God lives. Because as scripture teaches, God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. David says in Psalm 139 that we can't do anything to get away from the presence of God. Heaven isn't so much the place where God lives. Instead, heaven is a way of talking about the dominion of God. That everything in this universe belongs and is subject to God. Earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, don't swear by the heavens because the heavens are God's throne." Don't swear by the earth, because the earth is God's footstool. Everything in this whole universe is under the authority and the lordship of God. Uh, This is the most complete map of our universe that astronomers have created. This is really fascinating, and I found this online this week. Now, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is here in the middle. Well, let's assume that we had a space shuttle, and we could travel at a steady speed of 65 miles an hour. I know some of us go faster than that on the interstate, but let's assume, right, we had a space shuttle, and we could travel at a steady speed of 65 miles an hour. This is how many years it would take us to get from one end of the universe to the other. Does anybody know how to read this number? I don't. This number just baffles me. It boggles my mind. It goes way above me, my understanding. That's how big... And our universe is constantly expanding and getting bigger, as astronomers tell us, and yet God holds all this in the palm of his hand. He spoke all this into being when he said, let there be light, and there was light. This part of the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, reminds us of the transcendence of God. Yes, God is our Father. Yes, God loves us. Yes, God cares for us. Yes, God yearns for us. Yes, God wants the best for us. Yes, God wants a relationship with us. But he's our Father in heaven. He's not to be bullied or messed around with. He is a God of incredible strength. Uh, My all-time favorite Disney movie is The Lion King. Do we have any Lion King fans in worship? If you're not a fan of The Lion King, I'm not sure if we could be friends or not. But <laughs> It's a really good movie. The Lion King centers around the relationship between Mufasa and Simba. We got their picture up here on the screen. Mufasa is the father lion, and Simba is his lion cub. Mufasa and Simba, they have this great relationship. They're buddies, they're pals, they're friends. They hang out with each other. But then what happens later in the movie, spoiler alert, Simba 
runs off and goes somewhere he's not supposed to go. He disobeys his father. uh, And he almost gets himself and his friend killed by a group of hyenas. But then what happens? In the nick of time, Mufasa shows up. And he terrorizes the hyenas. They run away scared. And then Mufasa and Simba are walking back home. And Mufasa's walking a few steps ahead of his son. And then what Simba does is he steps in his father's paw print. Simba has this epiphany. Yeah, my dad is my buddy. He's my pal. He's my friend. We have fun together. But my gosh, he's a lion. You don't mess around with him. This part of the prayer reminds us that our God is a God of untold strength. Our Father, who art in heaven. And then that brings us to the third part, the last part. Hallowed be thy name. What does hallowed mean? Hallowed's not a word that we use very much these days, is it? Well, hallowed is an old English word that basically means holy. So when we hallow something, we're recognizing how holy it is. We're we're honoring it. We're respecting it. We're revering it. But in the Lord's Prayer, we ask God to hallow his name. Why his name? Well, in ancient Jewish culture, names were more than a way of physically identifying somebody. Names were associated with somebody's nature. So, for example, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, Jacob's name is changed to Israel because Israel means wrestle with God, and Jacob, at one point, he wrestles with God. In ancient Jewish culture, names were associated with somebody's nature. God's nature is holy. We're saying, God, hallowed be your name. In other words, we're saying, God, remind us how holy you are. But there's more to it than that. We're also asking God to humble us and teach us that we're not nearly as important as we sometimes think. Listen to how the psalmist puts it in Psalm 115, verse 1. The psalmist says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name goes all the glory. Notice how many times the psalmist uses the phrase, not to us. He doesn't just use it once. He uses it twice. Why is he repeating himself? He's being emphatic. Because the psalmist recognizes that as human beings, we have a tendency to glorify ourselves instead of glorifying God. To make things about us when they're really about God. We do this all the time. Francis Chan was serving a church out in San Francisco. Well, one Sunday after worship, a person came up to him. And he had this disappointed look on his face. And he said, Pastor Francis, I I hate to tell you this, but I just was not impressed with today's service. And he said, well, that's okay, my friend. We weren't worshiping you. As human beings, we can get so caught up in ourselves that we even start to think that our worship service is about us. The music is about me. The message is about me. It's not. It's about God. It's about revealing God to the entire world. Listen to how John the Baptist put it when he was speaking about Jesus. He, Jesus, must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Hallowed be thy name is about lifting up God. This is not meant to dehumanize us. It's not meant to degrade us because as human beings, we are people of worth and value. We are those who have been made in the image of God. Jesus died for us. But at the same time, we're not God. Only God deserves the recognition and the praise. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This first part of the prayer makes us aware of the communal nature of our faith, We're also reminded uh, that God has come to us as our Father, uh, that he wants a relationship with us, but he's also our Father who art in heaven. He made this whole universe, holds it all together, and he is one whose name is holy, who alone is worthy of praise. Praise be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this prayer given to us by your son Jesus. This prayer that teaches us so much about you. Your ways, your purposes, your nature, and how in Jesus Christ you want a relationship with us. God, continue to help us live as your people in this world. 
continue to inspire and shape us as we go throughout the sermon series. God, may we live as your disciples, those who walk in the way that leads to life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.